guys, two weeks into lockdown. How are you guys dealing? What do you think? Nothing good can possibly come from this. It's horrible. It's not horrible. I can think of hundreds of things to do in this time. Because of lockdown, every day is semi-formal. Because of lockdown, even Hugo can watch the circus with us. And because of lockdown, I can do my homework in the pool. Because of lockdown, we get to have our own spin classes at home. Maybe there are some good things that can come out of this bad situation. Are you enjoying lockdown, Leia? Uh, 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 uh. Well, I hope you enjoyed the Marais lighthearted take on lockdown and the silver lining that can be seen even in lockdown, that something good can still happen even in the midst of, of lockdown. And the paradox that we are looking at this morning, and I welcome you to the service this morning, is the term Good Friday. Could a Friday, could a day, as difficult and as disillusioning as the day that Jesus died, be described as good? Sorrowful, yes, perhaps. Uh, disappointing, perhaps. But could it be described as good? And so through this service this morning, we're going to look at that paradox. We're going to try and and see what it is that was so good about Good Friday. I'm so glad that you've joined us this morning. I'm so glad that you have joined us online and that you can share with us in the Lord's table a little later on as we celebrate the Lord's death. We celebrate it uh, because we know that He has done something significant, something great. And even in the context of our world today, the message of Jesus, the message of hope, a message of love and grace, and so we encourage you to remember Jesus. And even in remembering Jesus today, we proclaim his death until he comes again. So welcome. Happy to have you with us this morning. Join with us in worship. Participate in the songs together as a family or as an, ind as an individual. God bless and, and see you later in the service.
Well, as I mentioned um, early on, the, the paradox that we are considering uh, this morning is the word Good Friday or the term Good Friday. And I want to just share with you from 1 Peter 3 um, in verse 18. It says this, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body and was made alive in the spirit. I don't know if you've ever heard about the song that um, Bob Geldof wrote, um, Bob Geldof of the Boomtown Rats. 
in the early 19, 1970s, he wrote a song, I Don't Like Monday. I Don't Like Mondays. And the song was a reference to a shooting that happened on a school playground uh, in California, where a young girl of 16 years old went out onto the playground and she began to shoot at whoever she could see. In the process of that, she, she killed two adults, two teachers. She wounded a policeman and she also wounded nine children. Well, she wasn't remorseful as a result of the shooting. And, and when she was asked why she did what she did, her response was simply this. I don't like Mondays. I don't like Mondays. Perhaps you don't like Mondays for a different reason. Um, perhaps it's about going back to work. You've had a good weekend. You've enjoyed the weekend. And you don't like Mondays because now you have to go back to work. I can remember as a, as a young man studying engineering how, for me in particular, Sunday afternoons were difficult because I knew that the end of the weekend was coming and I would have to go back to, to varsity or back to technic on the day after. But if you think a little bit about just the days that we, we remember, there are some good days that we remember. We would remember certain days with affection. That there are certain days in our lives that we think back on and we think, that was a good day. That was an awesome day. It might be a, a day we met a friend. It might be a day that we got married. Or when our first child was born. And we remember back to those days and we think, now oh, that was a good day. I know that we also have those bad days. I can remember my dad in particular one day, so many years ago, he had been building a dam and he had spent hours and hours and days and days extending the size of this dam that he was building on the farm. And most of you who know will know the Eastern Cape is always in need of water and of rain and there's not a lot of it going around and he was extending this dam to, to provide water for the farm. And so he would go early in the morning, climb on the tractor get on the track to ride all day and sometimes come home late at night. And the day came when the dam was complete and the dam was, was finished. He went down to the dam and he looked. And soon after, there was a magnificent rain and the dam filled up almost literally overnight. He went down to look and just with great joy, he watched as he saw this dam fill up that he had been building for, for all these weeks. Well, the next day, he walked down to the same dam to look again. And during the night, the dam wall had broken. And there was a big gaping gap in the wall. What had been a good day had turned into a disastrous day. The dam had broken. When my dad remembers that day, he remembers it with just that feeling of, of emptiness that came as a result, a feeling of, of great sadness that came as a result of that. And so we remember days like that as well. We remember the days where somebody phoned and said something has happened to a family member and, and we remember that with deep sadness and, and we look to that day and we think that wasn't a good day. That was a, a bad day. Or perhaps we think back on when we went to the bank machine and we want, went to drew, draw some money and we discovered that there was, there was nothing left. We describe that as a bad day, a day that we don't want to remember. And we all have those days in our lives when we don't want to remember something that happened, something that took place that was, was difficult for us to, to handle. Well, I think if the disciples were to write a song like the Boomtown Rats wrote, I don't like Mondays, they might write the song, I don't like Fridays. Because it was on the Friday that, that Jesus Christ died. It's on the Friday that that the expectations that they had of their Messiah, the one that Peter had declared in such definitive terms, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was on this day that, that they had expected that Christ would, would rule and he would reign. And, and the furthest thing from their minds was the fact that he would go to a cross and that he would be tried like a common criminal 
and that he would be put to death on a cruel, cruel cross. Well, the reality is, is that that's what Friday was to them. It was also a day when they slipped up and where they dropped the ball and where they let the Messiah down. One of the disciples betrayed Jesus, sold him for 30 pieces of, of silver. Peter himself, who had declared that he would never abandon the Lord. Before the cock crowed, he had abandoned him, he had denied Jesus three times. All the other disciples, we don't hear a lot of them, but we assume that they ran when, when the tables were turning against Jesus. And so they had all these disappointments that they were living with as a result of, of their own actions and of what, how they reacted and responded when Jesus needed them most. They were looking forward to what would happen when Jesus became king and where he ruled in this, on this, world, in this world. We also know that they would have been witness to excruciating and terrible torture that Jesus would have to undergo and that Jesus would have to go through on behalf of, of mankind. They would look on and see the cruelty of soldiers. They would hear the, the jeering of the crowd, the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones who were meant to be the religious leaders and the ones who were meant to be the spiritual leaders. They would hear and see the cruelty. They would observe as, as Jesus was whipped and how his back was torn and by whips. They would observe as, as he, people cried out and begged for blood and said, crucify him, crucify him. They would have been there at the time when, when Jesus was tried and, and false accusations were brought against him. They would have seen and heard how Jesus has to walk along um, the way of the cross and how he would, under the torment of a crown of thorns that had been pushed into his brow and into his head, and how, as a result of the lashings, he would feel the weight of the cross that he was bearing. They would see as he was laid down across that wooden beam, and how he would be nailed to that cross through his wrists and through his feet. They would witness how his dignity would be taken from him as he was stripped naked before all to see and placed on a wooden cross. They would hear his cries from the cross, and they would see this incredible cruelty that was taking place. I believe that in those moments, the disciples would have described that Friday as, as a bad Friday, as a tough Friday, as a difficult Friday, as a Friday they would not want to see repeated again. And so why then is, is this day called Good Friday? Why are we celebrating today the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, something that it would have been so intense and so difficult and so humiliating and so um, degrading for Jesus to have gone through and to have experienced as a man? Well, we see that, in fact, God sometimes sees and often sees what we don't see. We don't see the light beyond the tunnel. We don't see the big picture often, even though Jesus himself had tried to explain to the disciples that he had to die, that this was his mission, that this was his purpose, that this was the sacrifice that he had to make on behalf of all mankind. There was no other way. There was no way through this. There was no way he could escape it. Even though that even in the garden, when Jesus felt the intensity of the moment, he, he cries out to the Father, if it be possible, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. He was very aware that he had to go to the cross. And so the disciples had to be recalibrated. Their, their minds had to be changed about the, the role and the mission that Jesus was about to perform and what Jesus was, it was here in the world to do. And this recalibration, to a great extent, would happen post the crucifixion, when they would encounter the resurrected Christ. But we see also that this recalibration takes place and we see this happening even in the very words that Jesus himself speaks and from the cross of Calvary. These words are powerful words because they help us to understand what, what God was doing and why it was that he was doing what, what he was. 
The first phrase that I want to draw your attention to that Jesus spoke was this, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Well, we know that the word forgiveness is a powerful word. We know that when we um, usher that forgiveness to somebody who has offended us, it's a liberating feeling, it's a liberating event. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive the scribes and the Pharisees, for they do not know that I indeed am the true teacher. Father, forgive the soldiers for dividing my clothes and for mocking me and spitting me and pushing a crown of thorns into my head and causing me to carry this heavy cross, the full weight of it all. Forgive the indignity that I've had to experience as a result of this. Father, forgive them. And in those words, there's this incredible mercy that, that Jesus shows to those who have hurt him and who have offended him. Father, forgive them. And we know that this forgiveness is a forgiveness that extends to us as well. Even as we hear the words of Jesus, Father, forgive, for they do not know what they are doing. We also see that Jesus speaks to, the, the, to the, those thieves who were bes besides him on the cross. One of the thieves um, is indignant. He's um, ac accusatory. And he begins to accuse Jesus and he begins to say to Jesus, why don't you get us down from this cross? But the other thief, the other person who is next to Jesus, uh, cries out for mercy to Jesus. And the words of Jesus help us to understand the grace of God. Today, he says to the thief, today, right at the end of a man's life, when he had lived a bad life, where he is getting what he deserves, according to the law of that time, where he cries out to Jesus and says, and says, have mercy on me. And Jesus responds, today, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus gives to this man what he certainly does not deserve, the grace of God. For we recognize that that is the offer that comes to every single one of us. And that's the offer that has come to those of us who serve Jesus, where we've received that grace, where we've heard those words, when we've recognized that, um, that Jesus um, ha has extended his grace towards us. We also see just the incredible love that, that Jesus had for humanity, even in that moment where he sees his mother, who is now watching her son be crucified. And she looks down at his, her mom and she say, at his mom and he says, Woman, behold your son. And he looks to John, the disciple, and says, Behold your mother. In those moments, Jesus is taking care of the practical needs that his mother would have. We know that Jesus, just moments and days and minutes and hours before he would be crucified, he said to the disciples, they will know that, that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And on the cross, Jesus becomes that demonstration of love towards his mother and towards his disciple John. By, your, by their actions, by your love for one another, will people know that you are my disciples. And this is the reality of the Christian message and the Christian life is that even as we live out this faith in Jesus Christ, they will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. Not by the knowledge that we acquire, not by our academic astuteness to all that we can learn about Jesus, all the things that we can find out, the historical evidence and everything that we, we come across, not by how much we know the Bible, as important as that is, but they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. Then we also hear um, the words of Jesus, the eternal words of Jesus, that, that help us to recognize the extent of the suffering that he went through, where he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And suddenly we realize that the intensity of the suffering, the intensity of the sin of the world is placed on the shoulders of Jesus, that he is experiencing this on our behalf and, and he's experiencing the full wrath of God in that moment, the wrath that was due to us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment of loneliness, 
in that moment of utter desperateness, in that moment when all of the world seemed to have turned against the Son, in those moments, Jesus cries out there those words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we see that Jesus becomes the perfect sacrifice. He becomes the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. We see later on he cries out, um, it is finished. That the work that he has come to do on the cross is done. And into God's hands he commits his spirit. And we see that even in these final words that Jesus speaks, they are words of completion. They are words of achievement. They are words of, of somebody who has fulfilled their mission. See, in Jesus we see um, the words where in the writer of Hebrews reminds us and says to us that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the author. He's the one who brings us to God. Even as we read that scripture early on, his death was such that we, he would bring us to God, that he would bring us to the one um, and reconcile us to the Father. It, as, a forgive, as a result of the forgiveness of sins and the grace extended to us, we ourselves can be reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ. It is finished. It is The perfect sacrifice has been made on our behalf. There is no longer a need for any other sacrifice. Even as the Jews would have been coming to Jerusalem at that time to bring their sacrifices to atone for their sins, year after year, uh, year after year, decade after decade, they would have to come and bring those sacrifices. And Jesus utters those words, it is finished. We recognize even in those words that the sacrifice has been completed and he has done it on our, on our behalf. You see, we see in these words the humanity of Jesus as well. Even as he cries out our thirst and, and uh, liquid is brought to him, vinegar is brought to him and he's given that to drink, we recognize that, that his humanity describes that, that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every way has been tempted as we are, are tempted, but was without sin. And so as a result of that, we can approach the throne of God with confidence, knowing that we have Jesus, who has done this life, who has lived this life, who has made a way on our behalf and, and for us. You see, we recognize that, that perhaps the disciples, and perhaps even like us, we, we look to God sometimes for the things that we want. Jesus didn't have a Porsche or a big house or um, a lot of status in his day. But what Jesus did do was he could open eyes that were blind. He could heal the lame. He could turn water into wine. And people were looking for those kinds of miracles. Those are the kinds of things that they wanted. But Jesus knew that beyond what we want and what we desire, the miracle perhaps that we want him to perform or how we want him to step in and to, to stop certain things from happening, there is something greater and something deeper that he recognizes in us that we need. And he gives us what we need and not necessarily what we want. And we see the shift of sentiment that, that comes where people recognize that Jesus is not going to give them what they want. They wanted somebody to come into Jerusalem on a stallion to conquer the Romans and to chase the Romans out and to regain their status as a Jewish nation. But Jesus comes on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. He comes not to conquer, but to die on a cruel cross. He comes knowing that the need that we have is, is one that is not an external need, but one that is an internal need, where our sin has separated us from God and separated us from uh, Him and, and His grace and love. And we are so deserving of the wrath that we and should get and Jesus takes that wrath upon himself he comes not as a conquering savior but he comes as a, a crucified savior one who came to die on our behalf and so when we think about this as a moment in a moment's time we're going to celebrate a communion together and I hope as families and as individuals you've got 
the bread in front of you, you've got the grape juice sorted out. And in a moment's time, we're going to just listen to something that, um, a song that Philippa wrote and also a little um, artistic expression that Caitlin did. And while, there, while you're listening to that, I'm going to encourage you to take the bread and to pass it around your families and the cup and to, to drink. But we remember that at this time that Jesus came and, and died on the cross of Calvary on our behalf. We know that he did this for a reason. He didn't just do this because this was kind of a failed mission on his part or he had lost control or things had gone horribly wrong. He set his heart and he set his mind towards Jerusalem because he knew that he had to die on the cross. He knew that we were in need of the salvation that he offers. And so let me challenge you as I close um, this morning. Where are you and what have you done with this one that they call the Christ, the Son of the living God? What have you done and what are you doing with this man called Jesus? I know that for some of you, perhaps, you are walking away and you have known him you've you've um, walked with him for a time and and perhaps for various reasons perhaps internally and and also you know physically you've moved away from the church or you've moved away from christ and god and you've started to live your life in your own way and i want to encourage you and i want to challenge you this morning to, to turn back to the one who loves you to turn back to the one who died for you on the cross of calvary to turn back to the one who, who defied what popular opinion wanted at the time of his death, that they wanted a, a ruling Messiah and defied that and, and rather did the will of the Father and died on the cross of Calvary, an undignified, cruel, horrible, degrading death on your behalf and on my behalf. Turn back to him who loves you and who offers you his grace and his mercy. Or perhaps you've been walking towards him, but you haven't taken hold of his hand yet. I want to remind you what the writer of Hebrews says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. I want to encourage you to take hold of the hand of God that is offered to you through Jesus Christ. To receive his forgiveness as you hear his words speak, spoken over you, Father, forgive him. Father, forgive her, for she does not know what she is doing. To hear the words of Jesus speaking that it is finished, the perfect sacrifice has been made on your behalf, and that his grace has been offered to you, and that you can receive that. You don't have to strive any longer for your salvation. You don't have to strive any longer to please God in any way, but to know that God is completely pleased in the sacrifice that Jesus made. And because of that, he sees us through the lenses of Calvary. And he sees us as those who are forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I want to encourage you to take hold of, of the hand of Jesus. And for those of you who have been walking with him, and your hand is in his hand, and you, every day of your life, are walking with him. And perhaps you've hit rocky terrain. Perhaps you've hit disappointments. Or you've hit doubts. Or you've hit those times where you don't know which way to turn. Trouble has come your way. I want to encourage you that, that he who has called you is faithful. And he will do what he has promised. Continue to hold on to his hand. Knowing that his big hand holds on to yours. And he leads us and leads you every day. And so as we close, we remember that this was a good Friday. It was a mournful Friday. We remember today with sorrow in our hearts that the sin of mankind would take the Messiah to the cross of Calvary. We remember that it is our sin that put him there. But we rejoice with the Lord Jesus himself where the word of God says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and scorning its shame. For the joy set forth before him. Because he knew as a result of that, men and women and boys and girls would turn back to God and be reconciled with the Father and there would be a family, God's family and that you and I have been brought into that family as children of God that we have been reconciled to the Father that we have been declared sons and daughters of the living God that the word of God says that even though we see around us you know, um, financial wealth perhaps 
decaying before us. We see the markets falling. We see the stock exchange falling. We see things going wrong around us. We see the country's rating agencies being downgraded. Then we, as a promise from God's word, they have an inheritance that is incorruptible, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That the word of God says to us um, is kept in heaven for you. And we have been given his spirit until he comes again to receive those who are his. Friday is here. We don't mourn this Friday. We, we recognize the sorrow in this day. But at the same time, we rejoice that Friday is here and that our sins were born on the, on the shoulders of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that Sunday is coming that we, along with other believers, will stand in resurrection power in the fact that Jesus died for us. But today, we remember and rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ died for us. And so, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, before his crucifixion, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Take this and eat this in remembrance of me. We know that the word of God encourages us to remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. He, after the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the New Testament or the New Covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so as you eat the bread and as you drink the cup, let's just give thanks to God for his incredible mercies towards us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning that together we can remember Jesus. That we can remember the, the incredible sacrifice that was made. That even though, Lord, the disciples would have seen this as a difficult day in their lives, even as many experienced those kinds of difficult days, we know that there was tragedy. We know there was disappointment. We know that there was denial. We know that there was the cruelty of the cross. We know that that all happened, Lord. And, and in many ways, the disciples would have, would have described this day as a sorrowful Friday. But we want to thank you this morning for your body that was given for us and your blood that was shed for us. That in, in two days' time, when we remember the resurrection, we know that you rose from the dead, that you conquered sin, that you conquered guilt, that you conquered death. And so, Lord, even now, as we have all these things happening around us, we only have the life that you have given ahead of us. We have this eternal life that we are reminded of. We are reminded of that verse in John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world, or for God loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that reality. As we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we say thank you in Jesus' name. In the next little moment is going to be, first of all, a little piece of art that's play that's um, done by Caitlin, and I encourage you during this time to pass the bread around, pass the cup around, and eat and, and drink and give thanks. And soon after that, Pippa will sing a song that reminds us that we can come to Him, our Lord and our Savior, through all things and through everything. Thank you. God bless as we continue in this time of worship together.
stand at your cross and I'm overwhelmed the God of the world is paying my cost author of nations rocks cry out his name the Lord of creation now nailed for my shame may my lips ever praise God overwhelming may my feet ever walk in his glorious ways may my eyes ever long for his king May my life ever be to God overwhelming. Alpha Omega with thorns in his brow. of the crowds Oh what infinite mercy displayed on that tree despised and rejected by the ones he redeems Oh, oh, oh. may my lips ever praise God overwhelming May my feet ever walk in his glorious ways. May my eyes ever long for his kingdom come. May my life ever be to God overwhelmed. May my life ever be Lion of Judah Now a lamb I slain A consuming fire Now a smoldering flame Oh, what love overwhelming, what unfathomable grace. When Jesus, my Savior, has died in my place, may my lips ever praise God overwhelming. May my feet ever walk in his glorious ways. May my eyes, may my eyes ever long for his kingdom come. May my life ever be to God overwhelming. May my eyes ever long for his kingdom come may my life ever be to God overwhelm me may my life ever be to you oh God to God overwhelm